Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 295 of the All Dolphins podcast. I am joined today on this Friday, May 24th, by Dave Hyde, the award-winning columnist for the South Florida Sun Sentinel. You ever get tired of hearing award-winning columnists, Dave Hyde? Never. <laughs> Never. But, but in our business, award-winning could mean anything from uh, the best of Las Olas Boulevard writers one year to the Nobel Prize, you know, and and uh, or Pulitzer Prize, certainly not the Nobel. And and uh, I, I tend to I, I trend toward the former and not the latter. So, um, but I, I, I'm curious who number three hundred. That's going to be a big one. You're you're you're. I'm, I'm listening to the countdown here. You must have fireworks planned for that. Just a little teaser, right? I didn't, but now you just put some pressure on me to come up with some things. So I don't know. Uh, and I'm still waiting for my, you know, Canadian born dolphin writer of the sports writer of the year award. And it's not coming. <laughs> I'll be waiting for a while. I can't, can't imagine it's the competition's too good. If somebody else gets it, I'm going to be deeply offended. Um, so as Dave mentioned, yes, we are working our way slowly towards episode 300. We're at 295. So today we're going to do a quick history lesson on the 95 season to correspond with the episode number and 1995 as you probably recall dave was a year where dolphins kind of went all in try to make a push picked up a couple of big name free agents in that offseason namely eric green to come over from the pittsburgh steelers and play at tight end steve entman who had been the former number one overall pick of the colts were the two main guys i also picked up gary clark who had been a member of the super bowl champion washington teams and Season started off great for the Dolphins. They were 4-0, including a 52-14 win against the Jets in the season opener, which is always satisfying when you can spank the Jets like that. Um, and then things kind of went south toward the second half of the season. Dolphins did manage to make the playoffs by beating the Rams in the finale in St. Louis, the old was Edward Jones Dome, I believe the name was called. And in the first round of the playoffs, the Dolphins ran into their nemesis, the Buffalo Bills, and the Bills are still gaining rushing yards as we speak. They wound up with like 340 rushing yards. The final was 37-22 in a game that wasn't anywhere near that close. And a few days later, a major change in Dolphin history occurred when the Dolphins and Don Shula parted ways to be followed shortly thereafter by Jimmy Johnson being hired as head coach. Uh, so, yes, you were around in 95, correct, Dave? And your main thoughts from that season would be? I remember being up in Buffalo for that game, and and that, that was the question: is is this the end of an era? You know, and and I remember that was going through the you know because they they hit the the brick wall of Buffalo year after year after year, and, mm -hmm. and it didn't look and and the other thing was Marino was getting older, and and you know the old Joe Robbie line from 1989, I believe it was: Are we wasting the Marino years? um was resonating again and um you know but uh you know what i remember is 19 i think they had 19 first round draft picks on that team you know it, yep i think you're right that's what it was yep and, um, not all of them were still playing like first round draft picks and 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 it was an older team i i mean it was an older team that as as uh a lot of times the season plays out great in september and and progressively you know they never were made they made the playoffs, but progressively mediocre as the season went on. Yeah, and you mentioned like the Buffalo brick wall, roadblock, whatever you're gonna call it. Yeah, 1990, 1992, 1995. Three times in six years, Bills beat the Dolphins in the playoffs until finally, mercifully, in the 1998 season, uh, the Doug Flutie game when Trace Armstrong sacked him at the end to clinch the win, which was a fabulous playoff game. Um, but yeah, those Bills were just. Unfortunately, Dolphins were good in those years. The Bills were just a little bit better. So I, I remember that the the winning Buffalo game, the Flutie Flakes and the mm -hmm. words were, you know, Flutie had a box of cereal and Jimmy took it and stomped. I think it was Jimmy, but it he was. was part, I'm sure other people joined in, stomped on it, and there were there were cereal all over the locker room floor. Yeah, and they took some flack for it because the part of the proceeds for the sale of the cereal were going to like charitable causes i think like some sort of uh i think a cause like research to help cure a, a children illness and then there were some who like thought it was disrespectful to the kids who, who were afflicted by the disease and 
I mean, it's like kind of, I, 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 mean, I want to be as sensitive as the next guy, but, you know, it's the emotion of a, of a playoff game. It's fluty flakes. I don't think you're really thinking about, yeah, we're stomping on the, we're spreading the, the, the sick children represented by flakes all over the locker room. I think that was maybe a little bit yeah, overdue, yeah. But, overdue about nothing over there. Um, before we talk Dolphins and what's going on these days, Quick shout out to the Panthers for an absolutely brilliant performance in game one. Holy smokes, were they good. Um, and as I tweeted out, my, my three takeaways from that number one game was Bob didn't get a whole lot. Sergei Bobrovsky, the goalie, not a ton of action, but he was brilliant when he needed to be. Fourth line was great every time they were on the ice. And Barkov, Alexander Barkov again. And you and you like you wrote this, loved it. You put, I think it was Dwayne Marino, Dwayne Wade, Dan Marino on skates. Love the analogy because I don't know if South Florida sports fans appreciate and realize just how good this guy is. Yeah, he's, uh, you know, they got a, you, you talk about a team that has been built. Because, I look, I covered the Panthers for 25 years when they were not only a disaster, but a dysfunctional disaster. You know, mm -hmm. they and yeah, I draw the line right when Bill Zito came in, you know, Barkov took off, and, and Barkov was going to be great, okay? He, he he had the talent and everything. He just needed the, the organization to come with him, you know? And now, you know, Zito, the other guy's got the two big leaders in the in – the, and, and I'm not a big person for leaders in sport. The, the media loves the leaders. But this this is real. Uh, Barkov's one quiet leader, but as uh, Paul Maurice said, he looks at a game, sees what – they, he needs to do to help win um, within the confines, and he goes to it. The other guy, the big leader, is uh, Matthew Kachuk. Um, mm -hmm. Big goal, big hits, you know, big moments. Um, so they're, they're a lot of fun team. They're a fun team to watch. And how's this for a very quick segue into as we dive into Dolphin discussion? Even though it's a different sport, do the Dolphins have those type of players who serve as a great example who can, you know, lead by example or by words, do they have that? I think Christian Wilkins might have been that kind of guy, and now he's gone. Is there anybody on that roster who really jumps out like that? Well, you know what? The I, And I talked to Paul Maurice about leadership, you know, because Barkov's a very quiet leader. Mm -hmm. He's a very quiet personality in the confines of how you think of leaders, okay? Yeah. And 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 Paul Maurice had a great point. He said, you know, we, we make caricatures of leaders. Oh, they got to be this – this type of guy, and, and he goes, no, they got to play into their personalities. Look, Tua, uh, Tua is, a, is a leader in, in the, the things, how he carries himself, okay? Um, but, you know, what, what, I thought, what I thought of is more as I've watched the Panthers, and I, I had a long sit down with Bill Zito, the general manager, and it's not just about getting the right players and the right leaders, it's it's – Look, the Panthers were the best regular season team three years ago, and they and they won their first playoff series in a quarter century. And Bill Zito fired the coach, traded one of the popular players. When the easy thing to do there would have been just ride this wave of popularity, and because it's been twenty five years, and now you're going to threaten to mess it all up and. But he, he said we can't win in the playoffs this way. So that to me is I'm talking organizational leadership, not locker room leadership. Organizational leadership. Here's what we need to do to win, and I'm going to go out and make the right decisions to win. It's not just collecting talent; it's collecting the right kind of talent for how you want to win. And and you can apply that to the Dolphins too, or any no, team. Just no, I was gonna, but I was going to say you're kind of serving it up on a silver platter for me. I mean, you're throwing me hanging curveballs here because. The argument certainly could be made that the Dolphins' style of play is fabulous for the regular season, especially early in the regular season with speed, 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 where it's maybe not so effective down the stretch where the game changes. You, you've seen it long enough. Games in December are not the same as games in September and October in the NFL. And, and that applies to every sport. When The closer you get to the playoffs, the games start to change, and it's a whole different ball game once you get to the playoffs. Completely. And I, sorry, and it's a lot, and it's 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 physical. It gets more physical. Okay, which which how's that? And hockey, you know, it, it it's understandable if you watch the games. Uh, the the more 
constant hitting, not, not, well, in Boston, they were fighting and all that stuff, but usually it's just brutal, physical, tight checking. In, in football, it's the line play, you know, that, that comes to, I will say this though, and being around, because I've been hanging around the Panthers um, more than usual the last couple of years. There's a lot of similarities in the way they want to develop players, their young players, and Mike McDaniel in that Zito said, Zito said, look, the first thing he did with Barkoff, he, he had a meeting with them and they, you know, they had some overlapping Bill Zito played in Finland and Barkoff's from Finland. So they talked anyways, it was a two hour meeting. And at the end of it, Barkoff said, that's the longest anyone's met with me in the organization. He'd been there seven years. Okay. And, and, and Zito said, my, you know, they're the, what the, the way Paul Maurice does it, the way he does it is let these guys be themselves and develop into the play, help them develop in the player as they, they see it. You know, obviously you're, you know, coaching and, and all that, you're going to, you know, point out flaws and, and work on strengths. But the idea is to encourage them more than be the dictator type. And that, you know, you, you, you want to draw a straight line similarity, obviously, to what Mike McDaniel does. And this is, I think that's a lot healthier way than, than it was 20 years ago or whatever in sports. Um, um, encouraging players in, in, a, in, in, you know, in, in a teaching way, but, but being a positive way. And so I, I think there are similarities between the two organizations. Yeah, but you didn't answer my question, Dave, though. My question is, can the argument be made that the Dolphins – I don't want yeah. to say they can win with the style they're playing because I, I do think they can, but they have to have probably more things fall right than other teams who are more built to play in January. Is that that would that would that be a fair way of putting it? You know what I would say is they have to show a more physical component in, for December and January, and that doesn't you can still go speed route and and all that, but you've got to back that up with and that's you know one of the questions of this off season they lost very physical off defensive line player and a very physical offensive line player. And, and, and I get they're, they're, they're filling in and all that stuff, but um, look how Kansas city won, not with a great offensive line, but with a great quarterback that, but with a very, very good defensive line led by Chris Jones. And, and, and so I agree with what you're saying that time honored, way to win is you got to be more physical and, and oh, and we just lost Dave and hopefully Dave was gonna and there he goes these pop back up welcome again Dave I'm back <laughs> the, the wonders of technology you were in the middle of saying I believe Chris Jones is the last thing we we're talking about yeah I, I mean but the, the larger point the question became you know when we and we we left last season saying all the, are the dolphins tough enough Mm -hmm. um, and and admittedly, they lost. Look, they lost their two edge run. They were getting guys off the street on defense. But mm -hmm. are they tough enough on offense? Uh, that component. Are they tough? Are they going to be tough enough now with changed pieces on defense? And and because we know they're fast enough, we know they're creative enough. We know they got good skill positions. Um, but yeah, ultimately, you know, football still comes back. Look at who's won lately. The the Eagles won. They're a very tough team, very offensively. The, the Chiefs have won physical team. San Francisco's winning. Not that they won the Super Bowl, but they're right there. And they're, uh, they got very, they're, they were built around their defensive line and, and a lot of places um, when you look at it. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I agree with you on that about the, you know, the Panthers made a, I don't know if it was a 180 degree turn, but it was a significant change. 178? 178? Yeah. <laughs> Just close it up. Uh, you brought up the point earlier uh, about the approach of coaching players in a more positive, more cordial manner, I guess would be a way of saying it, which, of course, brings up Vic Fangio, who's still making headlines related to the Dolphins now in his time with the Eagles. And we have comments from Eagles players, including a veteran, cornerback Darius Slay, a youngster defensive tackle, Jalen Carter, who, shockingly enough, this, are you are you ready for this? They say they love the guy so far. Yeah. And I know you're shocked. I know. I know. But um, 
Is there room in, in 2024 for a guy like Vic Fangio? And again, to, I, I go back to me. They were fourth in total defense heading into week 17. They wound up 10th, first time in the top 10 since 2010. Okay, so not every player liked him on defense. In fact, a lot of them didn't like him. But should we care? I'm with you completely on that. Uh, look, they got results. Whether everybody was getting to do what they wanted to do, um, the bottom line is they were a very good defense right up to the time they, you know, the Kansas City game, really. And then they weren't a bad defense that day. Not even. Uh, so I'm I'm torn. I, I wrote a column before last season calling Mike McDaniel and Fangio the odd couple because here's this nouveau mm -hmm. uh, guy on how to do things, make players happy, and they'll play best. And you got the other old school. Um, here's what you're gonna do, and I, you know, and and you know, I, I think it was a bad mix too, just from the standpoint the defensive players are looking at the offensive players saying they get. <laughs> if they get input in the offensive game. They're getting, uh, you know, it came down to little things in practices. Like Bangio said, practice is the player's time. I don't, I don't have my assistants running yeah. in after plays and coaching them, telling them what to do. To, that's for film sessions. They got to be able to think on their own and adjust things. Um, meanwhile, on the offense, it was the exact opposite. The coaches yeah. are. Running and, and, you know, four or five coaches after every. So it was a philosophical, you know, mix. And, and I, 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 I think I, I really think the defensive players looked at the offensive players. And, hey, look, they're having a lot of fun up there and, and we're getting our asses chewed off. And and that didn't help. But I'm with you. Look, the results were there. And that's why I'm I'm curious to see. Jalen Ramsey is going to have, have a more significant role for to believe everybody, what everybody said in the offseason. He's 30. Um, it, it is, you know, and I don't want to, in September, okay, we talked about it. How's it going to look in December? Mm -hmm. How's it going to look in December when you, because look, everybody knows he's a very good talent. Um, yeah. I, I just want to see what his role is before we say, oh, this is definitely the way to go. Because he was in a good role. He was in a winning role last year. No, no question. Um, here's one thing, though, that actually, as you were, as we were talking, kind of dawned on me here. Vic Fangio had been in the NFL for what thirty years. Did did nobody on the Dolphins like understand that maybe it wouldn't be a great match, and because of his, let's let's call it abrasive personality or less than less than sweet personality. I mean, it's not like it came out of left field. So, yeah, I thought that's why it would work, though. Yeah. I thought cop, bad cop, you know, okay. the yin, the yang. I, I thought, okay, that, that, that I can see how this is working. The question I have is, I mean, the most outspoken, I guess, would probably be Javon Holland, right? Yeah. Um, not, well, yeah. And, and my only point would be, you know, okay, so you didn't like it. I get it. But add something to your portfolio of half there's nobody of half to, on the doll Jalen Ramsey comes out mm -hmm. and you could tell he didn't like it he said he said some things initially right. okay there's some heft there and and look I like Javon Holland um but you know we know Vic Fangio knows how to win in the NFL okay he's won going back years um and and so you know I'm I'm um, I understand he's a, he's a different mold than Mike McDaniel, and I think that's really where a lot of things rub rubbed wrong. Um, but his his ways work, and and so you, you criticize him at your own risk in, in that regard. Yep. No, and by the way, the point I was making earlier about and I was being sarcastic about people in Philadelphia all saying singing his praises so far again because that's what players are going to say that nobody's going to say. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, not surly, but I don't, don't think I'm going to like the guy. I mean, nobody's going to ever say that. So. We need a, 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 a session on media asking questions at this time. Yes. On the one hand, that's all we can do. You ask uh, five guys on the offenses, two of being a good leader this year. Yeah, he's been a good leader. Two is a good leader. You know, yep. the head, you know it's like. 
kind of self-serving question, and it's the same to your point on Fangio. What what are Philadelphia players going to say? First of all, they probably had like two practices with them, and okay. second of all, um, would you criticize your boss publicly? Nope. No. No. Um, no, and also a lot of th- a lot of times too. Writers and I would never, I wouldn't lump you in that group, Dave. But some writers would go in with a conceived, preconceived idea of what they're going to write, and all the questions they ask are massively leading to get yeah. the quotes that they want to get. And that's, that's well, kind of, it, it is a like, time this time of year where nothing's happening really. Sure, and, that's fair. You know, so you got to come, you got to come up with some ideas if you're a writer right now. Oh, or, man, you're telling me, Stanley Cup, like I'm doing. <laughs> Yeah, and, and to me, it's all Dolphins. And if you're looking at the, the website under my name here, look on there, you will see a, about three or four stories every single day. And yes, it is a chore coming up with different story ideas. And I got a couple of good ones, including one I am going to reference in a bit as we address, because we have to, Tua and his participation slash non-participation in the OTAs. By the way, he put out a tweet on Friday, something like back with the boys. That wasn't from Friday because the Dolphins did not practice on Friday. That was from Thursday, I want to say. Tua was there Monday. He wasn't there Tuesday because he was participating in Nick Saban's charity golf event. Dolphins didn't practice Wednesday and Tua was back. Thursday, this after Mike McDaniel acknowledged that Tua has been there for some of the offseason program, has not been there for some of the offseason program, and that it's bringing up speculation that Tua's kind of in a pissy mood or not happy because he wants that extension. Um, and I and I don't know if it correlates. Again, there are a bunch of guys who weren't there for the open OTA, open to the media on Tuesday. Jalen Ramsey wasn't there. Tyreek Hill wasn't there. Jalen Waddle, Raheem Mostert, Zach Sealer, Kendall Fuller, Shaq Barrett. A uh, bunch of guys weren't there. So what do you make of that? Do you – you don't you don't go one and one plus two. Two wasn't – not there all the time. Therefore, he's pissed. Look, here, here, here's my working philosophy on, on players and situations like this. Once the season starts, it's all about the team, okay? They're, whatever role they're put in, they got to do it. If they don't like, they think they should be doing something else, expand it, whatever. This is what you got to do for the team. But once that offseason hits – that's the time to be selfish. That's the time. If you, you don't like your contract, that's the time you can make your thoughts known and, and, and you know, obviously in a, in, a, in a good way. And this, is, this falls within the parameters of that. If this is why he's missing, missing practice, uh, if he wants the contract down and he wants uh, something shown, um, okay, I'm not happy and I'm going to not be at all the OTAs. They are voluntary after all. Um, but this is the time to say, I don't like my contract. I don't like my role. I don't like this or that. And because once the season starts, you're a company guy. So, um, that's, that's sort of the philosophy I've had most every sport and it would fall to two here. And and I I would go even further. What, what, what is come July, come August, certainly come September, whether he missed a day or two in May has, will have nothing to do with anything. Agree. So the, this is a story I was referencing on SI.com slash NFL slash Dolphins. It was about other recent young quarterbacks who got a major contract extension and their timeline, how it relates to Tua. And then the one example that shows there's no rule in the NFL rule book that says the Dolphins absolutely have to sign Tua to a contract extension in 2024. I have maintained all along, and I'm going to keep maintaining it. The Dolphins should not. They should have him play on his fifth-year option. Be, and I'm going to name you somebody else who played on the fifth-year option who, oh, by the way, had been an NFL MVP. His name is Lamar Jackson. So, again, why is it that the Dolphins, as my wife is making a cameo appearance here in the background. Uh, hi, my love. Uh, so why is it – why is it – Written in stone, the Dolphins have to give to a contract extension. No, I, I agree with you. And if, if you know what, I, I I think this is actually healthy that 
come May's second or something, they just didn't announce, oh, we got the Tua thing, or Jared Goff signs the next day, Tua signs. It shows that someone's looking out for the organization here. On They're not just caving in to – because that was a the question. They, they've done a lot of stuff to make Tua happy through the years, through the Mike McDaniel years. Um, and would this be another – you know, another example of that where they, you know, I, I heard some national shows say, well, two is going to be the highest paid quarterback in football. And I was like, wow, what is that even, yeah. uh, is that a part of the conversation? Um, so I just take it healthy that, that, okay, there, there's going to be some, he's not going to get exactly what he wants. Okay. And, and there's going to be some give and take if they, I, I'm with you. I, and on the other hand, I'm looking at everybody. So many people have signed contracts. It's And again, we get to the Mike McDaniel way of keeping everybody happy. Um, but but I'm completely with you that, that uh, I would like to – I would overpay next offseason, which is what Baltimore did with Lamar Jackson. They paid oh. more, mm-hmm. but they got more answers or – uh, Lamar was, Lamar's wasn't about town. It was strictly about money. This, to me, has other issues. Where's the ceiling I, I, on Tua? We're st- I'm still not sure. Health, where's that stand on Tua? I'm still not sure. So um, there would be value in waiting if you're the Dolphins, and, and if so, I would and, – and he knocks it out of the park this season. I'd happily overpay next offseason. Correct. And then, and if you can't do it, then you'll use the franchise side. And another thing with Lamar Jackson also, I think, was the fact that he had a couple of seasons where he's got ankle injuries late in the season. In fact, in 2021, uh, he didn't finish out the year and the Ravens wanted to miss in the playoffs largely because of it. So I think there was a little bit of that question along with the financial aspect of it. And again, this is a guy who had won NFL MVP honors. Um, and Tua has been good, but has he been great? And I, I would say no. And again, I, this is not going to go over well with a lot of Dolphin fans. I get it, but those are just the facts. And again, the other point needs to be made: can we not, can we not overlook the, what the Dolphins have put in place on offense with the stupid speed they have everywhere? Fastest NFL offense at the skill position players, probably in NFL history. They have a scheme designed by a guy who everybody kind of acknowledges as a quote unquote offensive mastermind, if not genius. I mean, yeah, Tua executes it very well. No question. It's also quarterback friendly, like nobody's business, if we're going to be honest about it. And this is a system that produced 100 passer ratings for Jared Goff and for Jimmy Garoppolo. Yeah, I don't have any problem with it. Look, yeah, they are building town around them as they should. The, yeah. the, the question to me is, if you give him that big contract, you're not going to be able to afford that. Then who is he? Okay. Then, and and I don't have a feel for that. You know, I don't have a. He's Joe Burrow. He's he's uh, obviously Patrick Mahomes in a world of his own. Um, so you'd have to say, is he one of those top? I don't know. Probably five quarterbacks. That now, for that matter, is Jerry Goff isn't either. No. Um, and he just signed a massive deal. So this is where this is one of those. Sorry, Dave. This one of those where Tua and his agents were like, "See, see, see," and the Dolphins were like, "What are you doing, Detroit?" Absolutely, absolutely. And and you understand why there could be some friction between what's going on between the Dolphins and Tua. It's a excuse me. It's a tough decision. It's not a slam dunk to say you know when the dolphins got into this tanking and all that i was told by someone in the dolphin organization no matter what happens we're going to get our guy or there won't be any question about him that you know it, it maybe we miss on the building around him and everything um and it's almost the opposite i'm not i don't i have it, it's an incomplete answer with Tua. but if they've got a burrow if they've got a burrow well and we're approaching it's been four years. I was going to say we're approaching, and I hate to throw this guy, this, you talk about Ryan Tannehill territory. We have to say, how okay, how many years do you have to know before, how many years do you have to keep asking to see the guy before he's not the guy, okay? Right. And my line with Tannehill was he's good enough if everybody around him is good enough. 
And and I don't you, you, the idea of getting into this tanking thing was you wouldn't have to be using that line. And Tannehill proved it in Tennessee when everybody around him was good enough. Um, he was good enough to take it, help a team to the AFC Championship game. Um, so, yeah. I, I, but the the bottom line is, I think it, I take it as a positive that there's some apparent friction and we don't know the level of it between Tua and and the Dolphins right now okay and by the way Dave you're serving me up transitions galore today I mean thank you for that my friend Ryan Tannehill it's been suggested on a couple of national media websites that he would be a great fit for the Dolphins and my reaction was like I'm sorry what on a scale of one to hundred it's a point oh one um (laughs) Just, it makes no sense on many levels, okay? And and starting with the most obvious of all, okay, which is the Dolphins have done everything to, to keep distractive questions away from Tua and his, and his express line to development. Yep. And, oh my God, you bring in Tannehill, and here we go. And, and no one's going to say, oh, Tannehill's a great quarterback, but there is going to be – questions oh Tannehill the comparisons Tannehill to his career a lot of things and that's even before we get into um you know can he run this offense and is he the 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 perfect one for this which I completely agree I see you shaking your head no I'll let you take it from there but I I I don't see this makes no sense to me no, it, it doesn't because Tannehill's forte is play action pass. When you have Derrick Henry running the ball, his forte is definitely not making quick decisions and quick rhythm timing. That's Tua's forte, not Ryan Tannehill. In fact, that's Ryan Tannehill's antidote. So, you know, I would, I'm curious where this stuff comes from. Tannehill we, lives in Fort Lauderdale, and, and I'm sure somewhere in his camp, someone connected two and two together and say, well, wouldn't it be great if, uh, and now this is the time, these type of stories guy, it, but to bottom line, it makes no sense to, to, to bring Tannehill back. Without, without naming names, the two outlets actually are based in South Florida so, or, or one of the writers and one of the outlets, both in South Florida. So I think on that note, we're going to wrap it up. I am going to, uh, Tell you to have a great weekend and be careful that you don't find any iguanas in your toilet like Jalen Phillips did, because nobody wants that. Or as somebody That's a great wants Florida story, tremendous. The only thing better would be if it, in the winter it, it froze and, and and he went and picked it up and uh, put it in the toilet to, and, and uh, as people do in South Florida, and, they, them. and then they have it thaw out in their in their and they got a test devil in in their house. That's awesome. Love that. I like those iguanas personally. Not not in my toilet, but I like iguanas. Uh, On that note, as always, thank you very much, Dave. You have a great Memorial Day weekend, and we will speak with you next week. Thanks, everyone. And that applies for everybody. Uh, Enjoy the Memorial Day weekend. I forgot to mention, please like, subscribe, share, and all that good stuff. Enjoy the Memorial Day weekend, everybody. Thanks for watching.